The 2023 Japanese Grand Prix had a lot of action. And while it might not have been for the win, a lot of things still happened, and we're going to talk about it right here, right now, as we go over what happened this weekend at the 2023 Japanese Grand Prix. We're going to talk about the quick hits, my race quick hits, our weekend winners and losers, as well as go over the predictions I made before the weekend began and see how they turned out. But we'll go ahead and start off right now with our weekend quick hits. Okay, going ahead and starting off with our quick hits for the Japanese Grand Prix. I think the first thing you have to mention is that obviously Max Verstappen wins the uh, Japanese Grand Prix and seals the 2023 Constructors' Championship for Red Bull. I believe it's their sixth total, and uh, Max ends up is well, he it, we can't say it just yet, but pretty much seals up the 2023 Drivers' Championship. I believe he'll officially be able to win it after the sprint race in Qatar, and so that also is all but effectively wrapped up as well. So congratulations to him, congratulations to Red Bull on a dominant year, and then like, you know, we've seen in a very, very, very long time, if ever. Moving on from there, a double McLaren podium. I mean, I, I know it's been talked about a lot, but how far have they come in 2023? I still remember round one in Bahrain, a effective double DNF really. Oscar Piastri ended up, I think, retiring in the in the first 10 laps due to an electrical issue, and Lando Norris had a pit at least six or seven times or something like that at least it felt like it to top off some fluids and so to see where they've come now to coming out of suzuka with a two three and a double podium what a what a year for mclaren and mclaren fans it's got it must have been a very odd season to follow um from there also have to mention oscar piastri a uh, first podium in formula one obviously in the sprint race in uh, spa he ended up on the podium but that's a sprint podium and as we all know sprint races are imaginary and don't count for anything uh, moving on from there, Mercedes versus Ferrari. I think this is going to be a very interesting battle to watch these last handful of races this season. The battle between both of them for P2 in the constructors is going to be extremely interesting. Um, it seems like Ferrari has the more stable uh, performance in the car, but really, is it going to turn out to... Is Mercedes going to be able to overtake them as they continue to march down towards the... Uh, Towards the end of the season, I know that uh, they currently sit in P2 in the constructors Mercedes does, but Ferrari has been mounting quite a challenge these last few rounds. And it's going to be very interesting to see what that comes down to and whether or not the two teammates are going to be able to, you know, work together enough to secure that P2 in the constructors. And I'm for one can't wait to see how that goes. <clears throat> Speaking of a Mercedes. I think it's going to have to, I, we saw it a lot, a lot of frustrations mounting in the course of this one. Um, I think Mercedes is going to have to decide who's going to be, you know, the face of their team. And soon, obviously, we saw some, I think, some tempers flare when it came to strategy calls in this one as they were defending Carlos Sainz and uh, near the uh, the end of this Japanese Grand Prix. Um, Russell opting for a very, very bold one stop around a very high tire deg circuit, kind of left out to dry a little bit. Um, with Hamilton having much fresher tires and Sainz having even fresher tires still. Uh, Sainz ends up overtaking George after Lewis uh, overtakes George himself after they swapped rounds. And so George, unfortunately, was lost out to Carlos and they felt like he might have been a bit more, but who knows. But they need to get that figured out and quick because it looks like some tempers are starting to flare uh, in the Mercedes team. And then speaking of the cracks showing, this is not something we actually saw in the broadcast, but the uh, Pierre Gasly and Esteban Ocon coming home to finish P9, P10 in this one. And the, uh, the fireworks came kind of off the broadcast where Pierre Gasly seemed to be extremely frustrated with being asked to swap positions with Esteban Ocon. Earlier in the race, they did a little switcheroo when it seemed like Pierre had a bit more pace and was trying to chase down the pack ahead. But when it didn't seem to happen, they uh, effectively, from what I heard, were basically pleading with Pierre to swap back round and give Esteban P9 in this one. Uh, Pierre's reaction after the race ended, I think, shocked a lot of people just because he was very, very visibly frustrated and included a lot of gestures and a lot of, you know, wringing of the hands and things of the like. So it's going to be interesting to see what comes of that, if anything, over these next few rounds and the rest of this year. Um, really much, pretty much a weekend to forget for Williams and Alfa Romeo. Um, 
I mean, what more can you really say? Williams with a double DNF um, in a weekend, really just absolutely to forget. Alex looked like he had had a couple of moments where he was trying to make something happen, but um, thanks to a turn one incident, not even a turn one incident, a, a race start incident where he was effectively bounced in the air, um, I think that effectively sealed his fate in this one. And then Logan Sargent also um, just a little too much damage uh, after going bowling um, into Valtteri Bottas. And so what a weekend to uh, to leave and forget going into uh, going into Qatar in a couple of weeks for Williams. Alfa Romeo, sort of the same thing, just got caught up a lot in, you know, these incidents and eventually just came to the point where, you know, have to uh, put the cars down and just accept that it's not your weekend and move on. Speaking of, I say speaking of, I haven't mentioned them yet. Yuki, Sonoda, and Liam Lawson. The battles that these two had in this one were very, very fun to follow. They were going side by side a majority of the first opening lap where Liam had a fantastic start and Yuki was just trying to hold uh, hold steady where they were going side by side and it really looked like it was going to be a moment uh, between them before the, uh, the ultimate safety car uh, came out to potentially uh, save them from themselves. But obviously Yuki being confirmed for the 2024 lineup for AlphaTauri and Liam Lawson being confirmed as a reserve driver. I'm sure Liam came out uh, having a lot to prove and a little bit of a chip on his shoulder. And Yuki obviously wanted to perform well in his home race. It was it provided a lot of spicy action as the uh, as the race went on. And so I think that uh, battle in Qatar could be pretty exciting, especially since I know there's been talks about Daniel Ricardo coming back for Qatar. But I don't think that I think that's lost a lot of steam and he'll probably end up making his return in the United States Grand Prix at the end of October. And then finally, my last point, six retirements this weekend was wild to see. Uh, it was a mix of damage and probably just personnel limitation. And while I do say six retirements uh, in the race, actually only five cars ended up DNFing as we saw a wild thing happen where Sergio Perez, after getting taking out multiple drivers and having being involved in multiple incidents, actually retired twice from this race after um, Red Bull sent him back out onto the track to serve a five second penalty he had received you know, after retiring the first time. So not something I'd ever seen before. I'm not sure it's something we'll see again. I know there's already been talks about the FAA, you know, cleaning up that wording and in, uh, in the rule. So we'll see if anything like this happens again. But Red Bull was trying to avoid any potential grid penalties going into Qatar. So it was a wild thing to see. And uh, yeah, it had a little bit of ripples down through the way. And we'll talk more about Checo here in a moment. But there it is, guys, my race quick hits. We'll go ahead, let's move on now to our weekend winners and losers. We'll go ahead and start with my weekend winner, and I think this is a pretty easy choice. I mean, Oscar Piastri, first podium of his F1 career, finally comes in. He's really starting to show why McLaren was such you know, a savvy move to replace Daniel Ricciardo with the young rookie. I mean, Oscar seemed to have been fairly on the pace-ish with Lando, kind of at different points this year. And it, even in some instances in qualifying, surpassing Lando, but I think his race pace obviously still needs leaves a lot to be desired. Obviously, his first season and his first time in some of these circuits, um, I think time will tell. But I think he's been more it's been more than enough proof that he's worth the money that McLaren paid to get him in that seat. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot more from him going forward. But Oscar, congratulations! You are my weekend winner. And then on the other side of that, our weekend loser, I think this one also is very, very straightforward because, I mean, do I really need to say anything more than Sergio Perez? Checo, I, I don't know, even know what to really say about this. Damage at the start involved in an incident, five second penalty for a, car, a safety car infringement, a couple of terrorizing moves that actually eventually culminated in taking out Kevin Magnussen in a move that was never on, and then eventually retires twice in the same race. It might be one of his worst weekends we've seen in Formula One, or at least in a very, very long time for a driver that seems to be so consistent um, to a certain degree. I mean, the move that he put on Kevin was never on. It was the kamikaze dive of all kamikazes. And listen, as a Haas fan, we don't need any more help to ruin our races than we were already going to have. The Haas was never going to be good around Japan. And we didn't need Checo spinning Kevin Magnussen around in the middle of that hairpin to really uh, seal it for us anymore. Although it did give us a very funny photo where the two cars were facing each other looking like they were going to kiss. So that at least was something that we got out of it. But Checo, my guy, you got to get this figured out. I know you're stressed. I know you're anxious. But like this was 
Not a good look, my guy. Not a good look. And so I think it's pretty obvious what you are, my weekend loser. And then finally, we have my predictions results, as you know. And if you don't, I currently make predictions before every race weekend, with including our biggest positive surprise, biggest disappointment, our qualifying top three, our race podium, and finally, our Haas prediction of the race weekend, because we are Haas fans here on this channel. So let's go ahead and let's start with our biggest positive surprise pick. I went for Oscar Piastri. I think this is a pretty easy ding, ding, ding. Got that one correct. His first podium in F1. What more can you really say? I knew and I knew that the McLaren was going to be good, but I think it's been a minute since we've really seen Oscar Piastri really put in the uh, the work that we expect him to. Starting on the front row, finishing on the podium, absolutely a huge result for the young rookie. And so that is definitely a point for me. Moving on to my biggest disappointments. I went for Kevin Magnussen, sort of in the same vein that I knew the McLaren was going to do well around Suzuka. I knew the Haas was going to be absolutely terrible. And while it pained me to do it, I really thought this might actually be a pretty safe uh, point for myself. And while you know Kevin did actually finish last on track of the 15 cars that we saw, um, I actually pointed this out on Twitter as well. But with when you have five cars DNF and you've had other drivers that have had much, much worse weekends. For Haas, a good result in this one might have just been having both cars finish when you look up and down the order and see who didn't in the weekends other people had. So unfortunately, can't give myself a point there, which I guess is actually a good thing if you're a fan of Haas like me, that Kevin ended up not giving me a point. So I will take it. It was a little dis still, still disappointing as a fan, but at the same time, we already were expecting it nonetheless. Moving on to my qualifying predictions, I predicted a Max Verstappen podium. Absolutely, I don't think anyone was a uh, anyone was going to say no to that before this weekend began. I predicted a Lando Norris P2, and so I gave myself a half point for that because see, I did predict him in the top three, just in the wrong position. And then I predicted a Carlos Sainz P3. Obviously, Lando ended up qualifying P3, and Oscar ended up taking P2. And so I got one and a half out of three for qualifying, which actually is pretty good for me. And compared to last week around um, Singapore, this was probably one of my better predictions video uh, predictions to make on a weekend. But moving forward to our race results, our race podium, I said a Max Verstappen win. Obviously, I don't think again, this was an easiest point I think I could have ever gotten. I predicted a Carlos Sainz P2. I don't know what it was about Ferrari this year or this weekend, but uh, they just didn't seem to have quite that top podium pace, but they were definitely good enough for the uh, the P4 and P6 that they ended up getting in this race. But unfortunately, Carlos not on the podium. Um, Lando obviously taking P2. And I predicted an Oscar Piastri P3. So I got that one exactly right. And so for my race podium, I actually went two, four, three in terms of points, which is really, really good for me, at least when it comes to predicting podiums. And then we round things out with my Haas predictions from the race weekend. To recap, I predicted one car into Q2. Shout out Kevin Magnussen. I did predict one car into Q3. I think I expected a lot more from Nico Hulkenberg this weekend. And I know that the uh, the race pace was definitely not going to be there and <laughs> it's showing in my final prediction of no points finish. But I thought Nico was going to come out and perform very well around Suzuka. Ultimately, it ended up not really happening. So. I got my one car into Q2 prediction. I got my no points finish prediction. Unfortunately, I did miss on predicting one car into Q3. So if you do all the math, add it all up, I actually ended up getting six and a half points out of 11 for almost 60%. That's really good for me. And I will take that every single time. We move on now a couple of weeks in between before we head off to Qatar, a sprint race around Qatar. I'm excited to see it as a sprint race. I'm excited to see the circuit driven. Obviously, having driven it on F123, it's a lot of fun, but I'm excited to see what these guys have in store for us. Keep an eye out before the weekend begins for our prediction video. And if you want to get involved, I also give my community an opportunity to get involved in the predictions as well. And we can join the Discord down below to join in on all the action. But that does it for us here. The Japanese Grand Prix is done and over. One of the best, I think, in the year. But what did you guys think? Rate the race out of 10 down in the comments below and tell me what you thought of it and if it lived up to your expectations or what you were most surprised by. We'll be back in a couple of weeks for Qatar. But until then, I'll see you guys in the next one.